most exciting, the first and only non-fiction literary festival in India, with Harba Literary Festival. It is our utmost pleasure to have you all here, especially in good spirits and good health. As you may or may not be knowing, Vidharva Literary Festival goes way back to 2020, just before the pandemic hit. And what a nice uh, book that we have here today with regards to the pandemic that we had. So, uh, where we had the biggest celebration of literature in our very first edition, kicking off the concept of non-fiction in action. And truly, what a big hit, because nobody knew that non-fiction needed its own space to bloom the way it did in Vidharba. Even after the pandemic started slowing down, Vidharba Literary Festival made sure to keep up the spirits and hosted monthly run-up events, which spoke about topics as diverse as art, geography, technology, culture, history, architecture, politics, people, food, science, travel, philosophy, cinema, and parenting, which was my favorite one. And so, we have with us our new theme this year, Non-Fiction for Inclusion, which is a step further into the abyss. With that, in this time of today and tomorrow, we have about 40 to 45 authors, everybody. That's a big number. And so many conversations that we all can share, who are amongst us that can fit right into the theme, talking about some major conversations that we need to have. Before we begin, I would also like to put a small disclaimer to maintain the decorum of this room. Now, remember that you're here to listen to the perspectives and ideas of the authors who have deep dived into the subject they have studied for many years. There's a right and wrong in this world, but we don't need to conclude that in this hall today. So let's get on with the show then. Allow me to introduce you to the moderator of our session, Swapna Khanzore. She is a senior physician, diabetologist, and critical care consultant practicing in Nagpur since 15 years. She has a core expertise in management of all critically ill patients, management of diabetes, hypertension, and its complications. She is an ECMO consultant, and she is absolutely perfect for this session as she was one of the front warriors in the COVID pandemic that we had. Now, and also, she is also she is an amateur poet writer and also writes regularly for newspapers in English and Marathi. With that, let's move on to introducing our dear author of this session. Pranay Lal is a biochemist and artist who works for a non-fiction organization, non, sorry, non-profit organization. <laughs> non-fiction is in my head, yes, that's all going. But he works for a non-profit organization on public health. He has been a caricaturist for uh, newspapers, an animator for an advertising agency, and an environmental campaigner. His core competencies uh, lie in public health, environment, and the development sector. Pranay has, in recent years, branched out to become one of India's most widely appreciated na natural history writers. His book, Invisible Empire, won the Green Lit Fest Honor Book Award for the nonfiction in 2022. Now, may I request our dear moderator to get our esteemed author to the dais, please. Let's have a huge round of applause, everybody. Good morning, everyone. What a better way to start this literary festival than a topic like this, which has been viral, literally and figuratively, in the last couple of years. And somebody, uh, a great personality who has actually ventured into this invisible empire, and dared to break the myth that viruses equal only to diseases. So, welcome Pranay. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Uh, before we uh, go ahead and talk about the uh, viruses and their empire, I would like to know from biochemist, uh, from public health sector to writing, how this journey happened. Did you always want to write or...? A lot of people when they're younger, they know that you know they have this urge to write, and they are committed to writing. They hold their craft of writing since childhood. I mean, they read, they write, they practice their writing. I was not one of those. I would read only non-fiction books, uh, and I had very little uh, interest in writing. But I had a deep number of questions which I found nowhere in terms of answers, in terms of books. But you would have them in esoteric uh, journals, you know, in very very convoluted journals. So. One of the things I do is I read about 50 journals a week. Wow. Uh, you know, right from nature, nature medicine, science, uh, 
you know, to test things, you know, uh, sell for that, you know, those kind of, I'm, I'm basically a nerd, so I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that. Well, mm. the problem is that, you know, the, the quest for understanding complex natural phenomena is something that I've always wanted to understand. So I wanted to understand, like I was talking to you earlier this morning, yeah. is that, you know, we have rains in Pune, heavy rains in Pune and Mumbai and all that area, the same. So we have no rivers that, large rivers that flow into the western part. You know, so that was one of my pet questions that I had in geography classes when I was studying in Bombay. Um, when I started to work in the area of environment, I couldn't understand why you have, you know, teak forest. Now this is the teak belt, right? You have a near monoculture of teak. You have what are called even age teak forests. You know, they all look system of similar size and similar age. The same thing happens in Sal. So what defines Sal forest and teak forest? Why don't the two of them exist or coexist? Why is there a clear line? If you were to look at India's forest map, you don't know why they exist the way they do. So the question that always intrigues me is that why is it that we don't have answers to so many things? If India is such an enormously diverse country, not only culturally or historically, but also the things that underlies that which is geology, tectonic, climate, landscapes, you know, all of those things determine the diversity that we have in our country. And I was in the quest to understand all those things. Mm -hmm. And it's from there, I, I don't know if I'm making sense, but you know, this is where I have been very curious. I want to understand phenomena in, of nature. That yehi hota hai, yehi hota hai. You know, that's the question that I've always had as a child, you know, as Kathy Sharp said in his cousin. Huh? So it's, it's like that, you know, that you need to find the real fundamental, uh, you know, framework, the natural phenomena that drives the cultural phenomena or historical phenomena. How is it that Shivaji made 42 forts in such a short span? No other emperor in the world was able to make that many. That's because it was the basalt, the soft volcanic rock which was existing there. So if you look at any of his forts, he only used basalt. If you look at the footprint of the great Maratha Empire, which was consistent, it was on the bas Basal territory. It was nowhere else. Right? They, of course, went as far as Bengal and, and Arcot and Chennai, but those were only wars that were waged that far. But if you want to understand the Gadh of the Mar Maratha people, it was in the Basal province because they, those were the forts they could hold on to. Right? So I think we need to understand history and culture and everything in the con context of nature and natural. Yeah, so I think it was the why that uh, drove you to, into right. writing. Now, the uh, very obvious uh, question which I want to ask next is why viruses? What inspired you to write uh, about viruses? Uh, was it the negative connotation which was associated with it in last couple of years? Because it's a very, very textbook kind of a topic if you think, you know. A textbook could be written on virology. Uh, it's a very scientific topic and the only other author that comes to my mind as I was telling you was the author of uh, Homo sapiens, the Harare. Yeah, so uh, what inspired you to uh, write about viruses and uh, were there any doubts uh, one, when you started writing that how it will be perceived and received by people, you know, since you were writing it up for common men? Uh, you know, we lived in a very difficult time. COVID. Yes. So I used to work in public health, uh, I've worked for 15 years in lung health and one of the things that I heard from my uh, doctors who worked with my team was that we should exterminate all uh, viruses, we should use a broad spectrum anti uh, antiviral and you know take it every couple of years and make sure that you know we get cleansed of viruses and I said my god that is very problematic. I mean, yeah. So then I thought that you know number of viruses that exist in the world are so huge. I mean, the other fact that I think most people don't know is that if you were to look for cell by cell in our, in our body, you know, if you were to compare the ratio of the cells in our body and the bacteria in our body, or rather the microbes in our body, they are 30% more microbes than our own cells in our body. Yeah. Are you going to fight them? You can't fight that, right? Your skin, your gut, your inner all of them, including your cerebrospinal fluid. We are finding a variety of things that uh, live in our, inside our body. In medical college, it's still taught that your cerebrospinal fluid is sterile. No, it's yeah. not. In fact, you've got viruses that are protective. They actually prevent the exchange of other pathogenic viruses that could cross over the, uh, the, 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 the barrier. 
and actually infect you. Now we have a series of protective viruses all around our body. And that's only one case study that I talk about. I talk about many other things. For example, the breath that you are taking is actually because of a virus-induced infection in bacteria. If that action does not happen, the breath that you and I are taking right now would not be possible. The creation of placenta uh, is something that is a yeah. story. I think we I were was, talking about. I it. was going to ask so, you that. Yeah, so I just want to come to the story that you know. I don't think we can wish away or, or be in a war with the microbial world. I think it's it's something that we should you know get out of our heads. Uh, microbes are our friends. We have to start living with them, loving them, and working with them. It's exactly what Professor Rathod was talking about. You know, we are the man in the middle. If we antagonize the person on the left and the person on the right, you're in trouble. And this is the COVID problem is actually that the transgression that we have had with the natural world. There are certain communities, even in India, all over the world, Africa, Latin America, all communities have this problem. We love exotic things. There are certain communities that love exotic meat, right? Yeah. And that's where the viral crossover happens, right? But you know, the sad thing is that the lesson from COVID has not been taken, you know, to, to its logical end. Animal trade has actually increased. If you were to ask wildlife campaigners today, animal trade has actually increased. It should have stopped. If we are talking about biodiversity con conservation and conservation of forests and climate change, you know, the larger link to it. We have kind of not looked at that. Forget pandemic alone. Of course, it's a major cause of pandemic. All human diseases actually have a reservoir in animals. Microbes are not there to get out to you. you know, they're not. It's a complete accident. It's a chance event that actually that microbes have crossed over into humans. The most abundant, uh, or the most prevalent diseases that occur in us. Let's talk about some of them. Let's say tuberculosis. Now, where did tuberculosis come from? It's actually a soil microbe that got inhaled by cows and other herbivores during the domestication process 10,000, 12,000 years ago because we were living with cows and trying to you know, domesticate them for milk and meat and hide and you know, all those things. That's when the crossover with mycobacterial tuberculosis happened. Right? All the diseases that we have are either inherited or crossed over because of our regular interaction with animals. Right? So, I don't think we should be waging a war, you know. Of course, we have to prevent diseases, that's the most important thing. But this whole attitude that we are at war with the disease, we are at war with the microbes, I think that's wrong. The second thing that I think, again, Professor uh, Rakul talked about is inclusion and inclusivity. Yeah. The, with the, As a theme within, goes. I think the, yeah, the, the theme the, goes. The theme is that, you know, uh, we now need to look at microbes in a more holistic way. You know, the problems that we have, the chronic NCDs and other things, are largely because of our, this attitude of using chemicals on us and on them. Yeah. You know, that's something that is driving us up the wall. You know, it's putting us on the brink of extinction ourselves. Okay? Uh, and we can talk about it later. You know, how are we putting ourselves at risk? We are the dominant species, right? So the thing is, inclusivity here means that, you know, we, can, we need to stop calling microbes name. You know, we have one name for all microbes, Kitanu. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, there's fungus, there's moss, there's lichen, yeah. there's, there's chlamydia, there's protozoa, there's bacteria. All, the, all of them are so diverse. You know, and there's viruses, of course. So, but again, if you want to look at things like, you know, the green cover that you have in ponds, you call it Kai. I don't know what they what you call it in Marathi. But, you know, there is one word and it's a dirty one. It's not something celebratory. But think about it. If that Kai is not there, that green mat on top of sewage ponds or stagnant ponds or lakes, if that is not there, the free oxygen that you and I breathe would not exist. Think about it, trees are selfish creatures. They produce oxygen for themselves because next day they will be consuming that oxygen, right? Yeah. So the net consumption and production is nearly the same. So they have, if you were to do a ledger, you know, of how much oxygen is produced and consumed, trees only do it for themselves, right? Hamko oxygen attack. Nine. It's those organisms because they live by the day or by even hours. They photosynthesize, replicate, reproduce and die. And as they die, they sink carbon, they release oxygen.
So I think that's the free oxygen that you and I need. Sorry, I digress. No, 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 yes, it's sir. fine. I, so I think it's, uh, the message is very clear that we need to accept that viruses are indispensable part of our lives, evolution and physiology. So talking about the protective viruses as we were discussing, something that very much fascinated me was uh, human endogenous retroviruses, the uh, reference that you've made to that and the whole placenta story. So would you, would you just uh, throw some light about, uh, on it for our readers as well? So, yeah. I will show you a couple of images because, you know, initially we didn't plan this, but I thought that if that's the question that's going to come, maybe just have to plan yeah. it. But, you know. So basically, like I said, all infections are accidents, you know, because it's a chance event that a bacteria or a microbe or a virus has interacted with us and it has succeeded in infecting us. Because the bacteria actually was designed or the microbe was designed to infect some other creature, right? And it's chance encounter with us is the one that perhaps gave us this time. Let me just tell you a story about COVID. I think I, this is a little digression, but you know, COVID actually happened 20,000 years ago in the Han people in China. Yes. You right? mentioned and, that. Yeah, right? I mentioned it in yes. my book and nobody wants to talk about it. COVID is not new. It's been in animals uh, who we were eating or hunting as pets. We knew about them because our immune, immune studies show that a certain set of people called the Han people were infected with it many, many years ago. So this is uh, a recurrence that has happened and a chance event that has happened, right? So the point I'm making here is that all our limbs, all, everything that is uh, that exists, you know, our selection, you know, everything that we can think of, the way our eyes have evolved or our, or our lungs have evolved, everything has a connection with nature, with genes of other microbes and other creatures. And since we are an assembled piece, our genes are assembled from, you know, the earliest microbes. There is similar similarity between the earliest microbes and us, right? There's some similarity, 5%, 10%. Of course, we are closer to the chimpanzee, which is 99.9%, right? Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, so, but, the trick question, any medical doctors here? And, oh, thank you, sir. Oh, hi. So, you know, why is it in xenotransplantation the pig uh, organs are most suitable, not the chimpanzee? Has anybody thought about it? That's the question, right? Unati, yes. that's a legitimate question. Yes. Why, are you, why are you coming to pick? Now that's the question that this book answers. Yes. So please go to LibGen and download it. You don't have to buy it. But my only request <laughs> is... So my request is this. See, authors don't make money. See, I'll be honest, authors don't make money. Authors don't make money. As far as you are reading it, you know, we are happy. But just go and read because what we are fighting is bullshit. One of the most influential books for any science writer you were to talk to people who write non-fiction, is that we are actually fighting bullshit. Because everybody has been told, whether you are doing my medical microbiology, biology, we picked up a book called Anand Parayan or Chaurasya. Yes, know what Anand Parayan mean. was the book. Yeah, I mean these books should be burned because we don't <laughs> celebrate the microbes. They only tell you that microbes are there to get you, right? Yes. They are there to kill you. That's not true. Please remember that we have got to get out of that myth, you know. I think I, we, we need to move ahead sorry. of that beyond the pessimism. Yeah, no, no, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's Can fine. Can you go to the next piece? I'll just go quickly. Um, yeah. Next, I just don't want to, yeah. you know, I don't want to install you with these things. They're absolutely beautiful. The next piece. Can you just keep moving fast? Yeah. Just move quickly, quickly, quickly. Quick, quick, quick. No, just move quickly. Yeah. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Go to the next five picture. Please go next. Next, next. Most of these pictures are in the book. In the book. Yes. Yeah, let's go next. So this uh, is the time I was talking yeah. about. Yeah, but next please. I just want to go to the placenta story because I know. Um, yeah, please go next. Just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, next. Yeah, stop here. Yes. So you know, we get a limbs from uh, ancient uh, creatures. So how did the first animal move from water to land, right? And it was because of the infection of this uh, virus which is on your right. It's called a foamy virus. Why is it called a foamy virus? Because once it infects, if it infects humans, it's very commonly seen in horses in Europe. And what happens is it causes foaming from the mouth and it often kills the horse. It's a, it's a serious disease in horses. But this infection, what happened is a part of the gene from this virus went and embedded itself in a primitive fish, the ancestor of this fish called the pseudocamps, which we discovered in the Indian Ocean. It lives in volcanic uh, rocks that created Nagpur, which is now also under the Indian Ocean. And it lives in those caves, in submarine caves, and where it walks. It actually walks perpendicular, if this was the case, it would be walking on top, you know. So
So, have you seen a fish walking along a cave or a hollow cave? Uh -huh. No. This is a fish because it's got fleshy lobes here. You know, it's got fleshy arms, fleshy fins. These became the limbs of the first creature that ventured out of water and went on land. And that gene is in us as well. That viral gene. So our hands and our legs are designed by that viral gene. Okay. Now, is that embedding of the gene? So now we know about 8 to 11 percent of our genome is actually viral. Now, if you can recognize that, the 11 percent, 8 to 11 percent of our genes, they are viral in, in origin. Now, let's move to the next slide. Now, our ancestors, this creature on the right, our ancestors, this is about a picture from 255 million, uh, illustration from 255 million years ago. This creature is called Crenacidon. You can find fossils of this in a place uh, in Andhra Pradesh. I don't want to tell you that story. It's very fascinating, but some other day. You know what is unique about this creature is that it's got hollow teeth like snakes. It's got a scaly skin. If you look at its tail, it's scaly. It's got nails like a lizard, you know, a garden lizard. And it's got hair which are bristle-like. But what is important is that they were egg-laying. And when they got infected by another virus, they got the placenta. And some mammals, as you know, are egg-laying, like the platypus, right? They are descendants of this guy, the Phenacodon, or, or the family of these early mammal-like reptiles. A lot of our diseases, like there's something called ichthyosis, I mean some dermatology, if you study dermatology, or even psoriasis. Why does psoriasis happen in certain people, right? Or atopic eczema. Now that's because there is a reptilian gene that kicks off in some individuals. We all carry it, but it kind of gets triggered in and this is the reason why we have certain diseases which are actually reptilian in origin. Reptiles needed to have scaly skin. The scaliness in ichthyosis, ichthyosis is, is particularly good because it looks like fish scale like skin. It's a very painful disease for whoever gets it, especially children. Next slide please. So remember that this ancestor who got infected by a virus gave us the placenta. Now that's why if you know for some people Getting pregnant, not some people, some women, getting pregnant is a very difficult proposition because it's a viral gene that has acted up, creates an organ which is completely independent and completely alien to the woman's body. What happens is the immune system kicks in and says, oh, this is a virus, I need to attack it. So, you know, we were taught about spontaneous abortion and ectopic uh, pregnancies in med school, but I mean, I'm not a medical. I'm not a med guy, but I live with a lot of med people, so please forgive me. I'm trying to get myself absorbed in your club. But You're allowed to. <laughs> so the, the problem is that we don't understand why does that happen. We know how to treat it, but you know, do we know how to, why it happens? Right? So the story here is that again there is a viral gene in our DNA that actually triggers it as soon as the ovum and the sperm meet. It sends, sends a signal and says, start preparing a placenta, I need to embed myself, right? And that's what happens. And in some places, it so, so happens in some women that there is a reaction from your immune system saying that I'm not going to accept you, this is a virus. And that's when you have continuity. I think that is what that RH incompatibility, what we talk about, is also there wherein the mother is RH negative. And if the baby is RH positive, then it, it is said to be very, very dangerous. So this explains, this theory explains why it is so. So when we talk about these ERVs, uh, what do you think, knowing about them, uh, you know, future prospects as far as medicinal uh, discoveries and further, uh, you know, do you think there is any implication as far as vaccines are concerned or something else? Yeah, I think it, it does because, uh, you know, we also need to look at, uh, you know, uh, we need to understand how viral DNA integrates and when it integrates. So you need something called integrate, right? I mean, yeah. anybody who's a biologist here or... There's, a, there's an enzyme that the uh, RNA virus or the DNA virus needs to have so that it goes and embeds in the human DNA. Now, those events happen, you know, not, I mean, they're, they're fluke events and then they have to happen in a small population that becomes bigger. Only then does this become replicable, right? Okay. Now, in vaccines that we're designing, you've got to be careful because in case there is the integrase mm -hmm. that is there in a body, which is a rare event, like I said, you know, in, a, in a single individual or a class of people, right? especially uh, adolescent girls have to be very careful. I mean, when we are thinking about vaccination programs, 
I'm not trying to create fear. I'm just saying that it's a very, very small chance in it that this may happen. But currently, dislodging this virus from uh, its current position uh, or, the, or from the DNA is a, it, it's next to impossible. I mean, it has happened, of course, because that's how we are here. But the fact is that can a human vaccine do it? Is it possible? Yes. But is it probable? No. That would be, that would be my answer. Okay. So it's kind of a very improbable event. You know, it's a, I mean, I would like to put a number on the probability, but it is a very, very, uh, I won't say impossible because it's possible to do it. But, uh, but is it probable? I am not certain. Because during uh, the mRNA vaccine, uh, you know, discussions that were happening, a lot of people said that the herb might get the ERV, the human yeah. ERV virus that makes the placenta, may get displaced. So there's an entire exactly. conspiracy theory that has been put by some very senior uh, virologists, very respectable virologists. I'm not saying conspiracy in that sense, but it, I got picked up by conspiracy uh, theorists and said that, you know, future, in the future girls may not have uh, the choice of being mothers because our ERVs might get dislodged. Mm -hmm. Then it is, like I said, a near impossible. So I don't know if I answered answer your question. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So. Uh, before we move to non-medical aspects, uh, let's talk about the elephant in the room. What is your take on COVID-19 present situation, especially when Kraken and all the variants are in? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in viral cycles, you have, uh, you know, especially uh, RNA viruses, you have, uh, you know, they, they mutate really, really fast. Yeah. So, I mean, this one, I mean, there's a term that is loosely used, it's called down mutation. Uh -huh. It might be down mutation for us, but for the Chinese who are still suffering from the effect of this current strain, uh, XBB and Omicron, uh, for them it is a problematic issue. For us, I'm sure if we were to do an uh, antibody test just now, uh, 20 or 30 percent of us would be carrying the uh, antigen in our, in our blood mm -hmm. or in the, in the lung. Um, but it is not showing or eliciting the symptoms. So it's for us, in the moment, as in, as in a country, in South Asia, as a region, um, I think we are, I mean, we have to be cautious, because we don't know, like I said, it, 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 it mutates rapidly. Uh, but I think we can lower our guard, but strengthen us, uh, what's called sentinel surveillance, that as soon as we, we need to have random uh in population, right. and in several populations, to make sure that we are on top of the game. There's a new mutant that has come. Let let's be ready for it. And what is what are the implications? You know, is it going to affect a certain susceptible populations? The immunologically compromised people. Is it going to affect more children, more older people? All those things. We have to start working on those models. We don't have them yet. Right. So I think vigilance is the answer as of now. So uh, when I was going through the book, uh, you know. Uh, tulips was something that I came across and I just was discussing with one of my friends and I said what uh, comes to your mind when we talk about tulips and she instantly said it's that silsila ka gana dekha hai khwab and uh, imagine a virus being benevolent enough as you mentioned in beautification further beautification of these tulips so that's a, another point which she touches which is beyond medicine and really fascinating so can you just throw some light on that as well Please, uh, you know, we hadn't planned to do slides, but I just want to because many of you haven't seen the, the book, so I thought I would just go through. Okay, so the wild tulip looks like this. It's a very ordinary plant. It looks, it's actually quite closely related to the lily family, right? The tulips. They're found in the foothills of Kazakhstan. Right? That's where they're actually originally from. But, you know, a chance event that, you know, uh, travelers, uh, a botanist who was traveling from Kazakhstan went to Spain, and from Spain this went to Holland. And in Holland, at that time, as you know, it was the major uh, mercantile country. You know, that's where the colonial wealth was. It wasn't Britain, it wasn't Italy, it wasn't the other countries. All the wealth, all the big banks, as you see today, you know, ABN AMRO and all, Rabo Bank, for example, are Dutch banks, right? And they are largely on commodities. And they used to trade in Amsterdam and other ports. And the craze for uh, tulips became quite, quite high. Now, why was there a craze in Holland and not in Spain? When they planted the tulip, this tulip, in Holland, along peach and cherry and other trees, there was a virus from there which went and infected 
this ordinary flower. And when that infection happened, it created beautiful flowers like this. You know, some of them deep blue, orange, some of them were even fluorescent. You know, if you kept them in a dark room, they looked in a different color. And they were absolutely gorgeous. The flower was much bigger than the stem. In fact, there's a, there's a, there's a, there are papers, uh, writings from the historical past, that the flower grew so large that the, the stem would break. You know? And so you think about it, a single virus infection could elicit so many different colors in the same plant, from the same stock, same species. It's not diverse species, right? Now, people wanted this. They said, we've got the wealth. They were, you know, this is the time when Rembrandt was painting. You know? mm -hmm. Think about yeah. Nightwatch and all the great paintings we made. Rembrandt at one time remarked saying that sometimes I'm compared, my paintings, my masterworks are compared to a flower, you know. And people want to buy the flower more than my painting. Right? Think about it. And people said that, you know, I mean the traders who had everything, you know, they were getting shiploads of, uh, you know, spices and ivory and exotic animals and everything, said that, you know, one tulip flower of this beauty for five ships that are coming in from the Indies. So that is the level of craze that happened. But one particular year, it so happened that the virus did not cross over. And they produced the same, when the bulb was, you know, was in the ground, they said, it's all come the plain, you know, the little very plain by the, the one that you see in Silsila, yeah. or yeah. this color. So this is a bicolored one. In Silsila, there's a variety called the Dago, the red, orange, and you see the single bed, right? Eki color came in, right? So they're called the Darwin variety. Now those have been made viral proof, the ones, and we are no longer permitted to introduce the 40 virus, the virus that came from the plum and the cherry trees that created these magnificent varieties, we are not permitted to do that because they can be other ramifications. So the story is that, you know, it's chance events, the virus crossover that has created all the beauty. So this is the next slide, I just want to talk about a few other things which I don't talk about in the book. All the grapes that you eat, and Nashik has lovely grapes and Hyderabad has lovely grapes. Wild grapes that are on the left looks like this. If you were to eat it, you'll get a bad stomach. In fact, it is within a minute you will be looking for a bush if you are in, a, in, in the open. Trust me, it is really bad. It's karva, it's poisonous, nearly poisonous. You want to puke it out, if you swallow it, you need to find a bush. Okay? But a viral infection makes it palatable, sweet and bunchy. And the ripening happens at the same time. Think about it, ripening is important. Next thing. This is wild rice. This is how rice is produced in, in the wild. What happens is that, you know, it ripens at different times. That's the survival strategy of grasses. If it gets eaten by insects or, or, or say a buffalo or something, right, a herbivore, the chances of the other paddocks producing another set of seeds is only a survival strategy, right? But for rice that we eat or the wheat that we eat, it ripens at the same time. Think about it, if rice ripened like the wild, the wild variety, it would be so difficult for us to keep going to single plants and collect 5 grains or 10 grains. Just now we go and collect 30, 40 grains, 50 grains from a single plant at one time. So this viral infection has made the grass, or for at least for us, this harvesting efficient. I think uh, that's good enough. I mean, it was a very, very, very interesting aspect of, uh, you know, virology that it adds on to the beauty because all we know when we talk about viruses is destruction, disease. And to uh, know the creative side, if I would say, of the viruses was really uh, amazing. And such few other aspects that he touches and revolutionizes the, uh, you know, uh, the perspective of looking towards viruses and from getting them uh, to be called as villains <laughs> to getting them back to the hero uh, uh, pedestal. Uh, so I think, uh, how, would you, how would you just sum up the whole uh, uh, book? And what is one thing, uh, you know, what, what, uh, in what way do you think a common man will benefit by knowing all the aspects of viruses? I think, uh, you know, I think if you were to make viruses uh, central and say that these are one of the representatives of what we see in nature. I think the spirit in which we accord any respect to viruses is what we do to nature. We do the same to trees. We like certain trees, we don't like certain trees, we Correct? Even if they are 
I mean, of course, if they are exotic Central Asians and are ruining your forest or your garden, then it's another issue. But I'm just saying that the point uh, here is that our relationship with the virus is exactly what we also treat nature with, or even landscape, rocks, rivers, anything. We think it's all malleable. We want to eradicate a virus, a disease, and it's okay to eradicate. There's no problem if it's become a burdensome disease and it's exclusively now a human disease, of course it should be. Smallpox, for example, or rinderpest. Yeah. But, the, but the question is, we should not wish away our relationship with nature and our relationship with microbial world. I mean, that's something integral. You can't change it. You have to respect it. You have to live with it. Uh, you know, studies in longevity, for example, yeah. that are coming out, they say that People who live longer are the ones who have had the most stable microbiome. They have not had changes in diets or, you know, the kind of foods that we are now taking in, you know. High in sulphide and sulphur. High in dioxins because of plastic, you know. All that is changing our microbiome. But look at people who live very long, you know, 80, 90, 100 years or even beyond 100. There is something that about them that they just live in harmony with the organisms that they grew up with. Right? And that, I think, is a case in point. I'm just giving you an example here of, uh, of our own body. But the same thing, like I spoke about in terms of oxygen and carbon, I think the climate change discourse currently is, is so flawed that I just can, I don't want to even begin on it. You know, it, it's so wrong just now. Uh, so, I, do, I mean, climate change, biodiversity, uh, landscapes, our current problems are something that are taken as, you know, a direct correlation. This is happening, do this, this will happen in this much time. Here is the economics of it. That's not how nature works. Right, Pranesh. So I think uh, it's just about the perspective, modification of, a, uh, of the perspective. Sure. So let's uh, have some audience questions, if there are any. We would love to have them. Yes, sir. I've collected this book. Thank yeah. you. It's uh, beautiful. And I think it will be a privilege to have it in my collection. Thank you very much. Absolutely, it's, sir. Uh, very reasonably priced. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for writing such a book for the layman. And uh, I do appreciate this effort. Uh, my questions are on two counts. Can we rest the theory that the pandemic was man-made, number one? And can we really stop the companies from fooling humanity from making profits by saying that we have give this vaccination, that vaccination, to cure and take your health. These are the two things which I would like you to highlight. Thank you. Okay, I can, first question uh, I can answer with some confidence. The second one I can't, I'll be honest. Yeah. Uh, so, is this a man-made virus? Uh, no, it's not a man-made virus. Is this a man-made tragedy? Yes, it's a man-made tragedy. Okay. So, why is it not a man-made virus? So the question that you should ask yourself is a rational being. I'm not talking about the biological genetic makeup. We will not get into that. It's, 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 uh, it's, that also is very simple for any biologist. So if I were to make, I'm an evil, you know, Shakal or, you know, one of the Bond villains, you know, if I were something like that and I had the genetic knowledge, I had 10 uh, biologists working for me, uh, I would not make a virus like this. Because, uh, you know, of course it has good transmissibility, it's quite effective, but you know, it is very variable, you know. I would have, uh, you know, I would have used certain other aspects to it to make it slightly more different. So if it was designed to affect certain parts of the economy, the world economy, or yet you see child thing, yeah, it was a lab leak. I don't think, I mean, lab leak is the, I mean, even the most skeptical people have now said, this was not a lab leak. So that is kind of very clear. I think there was a big discussion happening on the science.com, the website, you know, science magazine. The second question, are the vaccines working or not? Uh, to my sense, yes, vaccines have worked in stopping from progression of serious disease, especially in those who had uh, chronic conditions. Uh, there are good studies on this. Italy has just come up with its cohort study, very large one before and after, before vaccination and after vaccination, I think that's a clear case in point. So I don't think it's premature, but coming to the protocols that, uh, you know, Government of India and everybody else came up with, use, use you know, medicines of X, Y and Z, azithromycin, for example, uh, 
uh, all of those, I think those were, uh, I mean, quininoform, I mean, chloroquine was being promoted. Yeah. I thought that was ridiculous. It didn't work. You have a question? Uh, thanks, Pranay, for bugging us with such a fascinating <laughs> right. A quick, uh, quick response from you. I was pretty intrigued by the use of that word empire in your title. Yes. And if you look at the 400 years of colonial expansion, you're talking about empires, empire building has also been about the migration of bodies. Migration of bodies have also been subsequently followed with uh, migration of viruses. Sure. Uh, was that a conscious thing? Were you aware of it? It was, yes. I think because the control that the virus has on every creature you know, is incredible. Now, what we know is that when you look at uh, the mapping of uh, all the species that exist in the world, insects, everybody just clubbed together. Imagine that we have 242 known viruses that infect us. And even if we were to say that, say, a protozoan or a bacteria gets infected by five viruses, now compute that and see how many of them exist. And how many of them are on a daily basis, uh, how many million epidemics are happening across the uh, natural world. That's incredible, right? Just now as we speak, we've got a big uh, viral problem in a forest in India, you know. Just, and we're not even talking about it. That's it. It's a massive problem. Uh, hi. Uh, you know, your talk was really fascinating and I'm really going to read the book now. Uh, what I wanted to ask you was, you talked about, you know, viruses uh, infecting us and uh, our body has a different mechanism, like when you said, you for pregnancy, uh, tries to, you know, bought it out. Uh, so my question is that, uh, you know, if we have such a system, then why is it that some viruses cross over from the animal host and jump into the human host and, uh, you know, like we had chicken gunia, which was an animal host, but infected us and created a havoc and of course now we have the COVID. So what is it that allows some viruses, you know, to jump host? Well, so chicken gunia is a well-known uh, uh, viral fever. I mean, we have a reservoir and we have a very, very, very prolific vector. Now, that enables this crossover and we know this happening all over. But this, the real challenge is the new fevers that are coming in which come and take us by surprise. Like take SARS-CoV-2. The, 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 the real uh, uh, issue here is that we need to look at the compatibility between say primates and say pigs and others who are immunologically very close to us. And if they have viruses of the kind that you are talking about, then it's going to cross over. Let's talk about say uh, Japanese encephalitis. You find the reservoirs of Japanese and encephalitis and crocodiles and muggers and herons and egrets, right? And ducks, right? Think about it, think about flu. The, the crossover of flu happens from ducks and migratory birds in central, uh, south central North America, you know, that whole corridor of Midwest. Or in some other pockets, of course, in India and China. We've got these hot spots where you see the evolution or the emergence of a new strain of flu. But it starts from birds, largely, can go to cows as well, but it goes certainly into humans. So that's why the prediction that everybody is waiting for in April is what's going to emerge in October, November, December for the flu season. And that's how the flu shots are made. But, so it can be very distant, it can be very close. Immunologically close creatures like pigs and chimpanzees, the question that I raised up front, versus things that are distant, ducks for example. Ducks are, you know, very, you know, on the, on the uh, evolutionary tree are very far from us. So, thank you so much, Pranay. Trust me, dear readers, I have uh, read this book and as a doctor, I can tell you that this is way beyond uh, diseases and it actually celebrates the beauty of viruses and the struggles they also face. As Pranay has rightly uh, said in one of his chapters that, you know, being tiny, is, it's not easy being tiny and being a parasite. And it's even more difficult when you're out of sight when you're not visible to the naked eye. So it becomes more difficult. But then uh, this book not just, uh, you know, uh, tells you about the beautiful world of viruses, but it also is a very, very humbling experience to read this book because it just somewhere tells you that, you know, you're just a drop in the ocean and there's much more to this world uh, beyond your own self. So thank you once again. It has been really an enlightening book as well as ses session. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you everybody for uh, being such wonderful listeners. So before you leave, we have a little bit of a present for you, which is made by a student at Alagangal Community. She's made a one-of-a-kind painting just for you.
So I'll have our volunteer just present it to uh, vice of the man. Can we, uh, so can we show it to the audience please? Yes. Thank you so much. Her name is Vanshika and she is from Alagangal community. She has been making paintings for all our authors who come here. So she's exceptional.